Andy, thanks for being part of the Champions of Data and AI series. It's great to see you again. Hey, Chris. It's really great to see you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's jump right in. So why don't, uh, if you can give the audience kind of a quick introduction to yourself, you know, your role as the Chief Data Officer at at and um, and without disclosing, you know, any proprietary information, like, you know, tell us a bit about some of the things you're working on that are helping uh, at and drive forward with customer acquisition, you know, customer 360, that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the chief data officer at at and um, You know, we have so much, you know, data, you know, at our fingertips at at and We're really transforming the company, you know, to be data first, to be AI first. Um, you know, I think the the movement across at and to really embrace that vision is, is super uh, encouraging. And, and we're doing so many, you know, wonderful things for the company and for our customers, you know, using data and AI. I mean, one of the coolest things that we're working on right now um, is an effort to, to really suppress robocalling. So, hey, you're a mobility, you know, consumer, whether you're an AT&T consumer or not, you know, it's a, you know, it's a hassle, right? You know, we all get burdened down with that, with that, nuisance that we have from robocalling. Um, and so we've taken an approach to, to, to tr tackle that with data and AI. And, you know, we've used a lot of, you know, standard techniques with, you know, AI and ML, and then added, you know, graph-based solutions to that to suppress, you know, that nuisance robocalling activity. And to date, so far this year, we've suppressed over 7 billion robocalls. And we just released new functionality, uh, I think it was two, three weeks ago, where we're suppressing an additional 40% more. So 5 million robocalls additional, uh, additionally suppressed per day. So it's really awesome to see, you know, great technical work, you know, in data and AI really drive value to our customers and to our consumers. And hopefully if you're an at consumer, you've noticed a drop in your robocalls too. That's, that's really cool. I mean, most of our viewers are always keenly interested when we talk to data leaders such as yourself, you know, you are in a very senior role at a major, major corporation. Uh, there, people are very interested in your path and how you got there. And so the question is, you know, is this something that was by design? Like, have you been pretty methodical in your career selection and what roles you've taken within organizations? Or is this something some of our leaders, you know, have always had a love for data and then the, the chief data officer role has kind of emerged in the last few years and, and sort of, frankly, sort of just fell in their lap and uh, they were the right person at the right time. Uh, how did it play out for you? It's, so, Chris, I mean, it's been a gradual, um, you know, uh, involvement for me. So, you know, I have an undergraduate, a graduate degree um, in statistics from the University of Alabama. So roll tied to anybody uh, that has an affiliation with Alabama. Um, but, you know, out of school, you know, started, you know, building, you know, models, first of all, to predict, um, you know, risk associated, um, you know, with, you know, with lending, right? So built some of the first commercially available, you know, credit scoring models, and they were cutting edge at the time, right? But they're, they're, they're commonplace today. And, you know, from there, I moved into modeling on the publishing side of the world, uh, you know, subscriber acquisition, you know, subscriber, you know, churn and retention management. Um, and at that time, I kind of took over responsibility in this publishing world for, you know, the analytical database. And so that moved me from not just the analytical side of the of the house, but also to the data side. And so I've kind of had, you know, both feet in both worlds ever since. That was about 30 years ago. Um, now, a lot's changed uh, in those 30 years. I mean, that first analytical database I, I worked on was written in Assembler. Um, I can read and write a little assembler. It's kind of the, the, a true dark art, you know, but um, it, it's it's all changed, right? But the same focus on customer, on driving value for the business is still there, right? So, you know, statistics has kind of converged into data science. You know, we're no longer running on-prem systems. We're, we're, we're running our data environment in the cloud. We're using great, you know, technology like Databricks, but, you know, that, that core focus and the focus that I've had over time uh, in my career is to use these technologies to really, you know, serve the business better and to serve our customers better. Yeah, when I talk when I talk to people in your role and the chief data officer role, I think is fascinating to me. Um, and I, I 
I appreciate the balance between uh, the business acumen that, that a leader has and understanding the business and what the key business stakeholders are looking for from data leaders. The technical acumen is really kind of my passion, right? And so you talk about, you know, assembler and like, you know, having been very deep in the tech and then of course the interpersonal skills and, and the leadership skills. For the tech skills, tell me a little bit about how you feel that's helped you in your career uh, having such a strong technical background. You know, I think it's foundational. And, and I'm not going to say that some people can't do it without it, but for me, it's been essential um, to really understand a few things, to understand what I'm asking people to do. Um, both, you know, how much time I, you know, I really think it's going to take, you know, how, you know, what I'm really asking them to divide off in, in, in an exercise to, to perform a function. Um, I think since, since I've been there and done that, and I've, you know, lived through that, you know, process, I can guide the team better. And on the other side, I think it's really helped me on the vision of what our target architecture needs to be, you know, all throughout my career, right? I mean, because I've been there and done that, you know, I, I, I know the trade-offs um, of architecture, uh, of the technical side of it. And so, again, I might not be the expert on it, but I understand, you know, what we're giving up, what we're getting uh, in the balance to make those the right decision for the architecture of our future. And I think we're in a great spot. And, uh, you know, working with you guys, working with Databricks is a core part of that. That's great. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I noticed in my career over the last seven years in particular with the move to the cloud is our business stakeholders that I interacted with in my previous role before Databricks, they were so much more technically savvy than business stakeholders that I had worked with, say, 15, 20 years ago. And now it's a lot more collaborative and your stakeholders understand this, these technologies a lot better than, than they did, say, you know, 20 years ago. And so to me, I think the challenge for data leaders and, and technical data leaders in particular is to always continuously learn and, you know, frankly, to try and stay ahead of the curve because you, don't, you want to be hopefully the trusted advisor in the room to your business partners. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think not only on the technology side, you know, are the, the business leaders, um, you know, becoming more fluent. I think on the, on the you know, analytical side too. Uh, I think people are understanding, maybe not the theory uh, of what we're doing, but for sure the application. Um, and that's super helpful too. So you're not starting from scratch. Uh, I'll tell you a very quick story. I was in a meeting this week with John Stanky, who's the CEO of at and And uh, we're talking about a project we're working on. And he made a, a little joke to the side about, you know, R square. I thought, Oh, that's awesome. You know, the CEO just, you know, made a, a kind of a, an inside joke about, the, the, you know, the, how strong the R square was on, on this project. And uh, I loved it. I was so impressed with that. I'm not sure everybody else in the room got it, but I did. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, well, let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the unique challenges that AT&T faces as a regulated industry, right? Help, help us, the audience, understand, like, how do you view that balance between ensuring the compliance, but then making sure that your data teams have access to the broadest set of data to improve the user experience? You know, our general guideline is that, you know, if we use data in a transparent fashion, and we're using data and AI to really deliver value to our customers, you know, we're on the right track. And, and we work with our privacy teams, our legal teams to just ensure that we're staying within the guardrails and they're great partners. But really, you know, if we, if we, if we keep that as our core tenant, you know, our guiding principle, you know, we're, we're, we're often mostly, you know, straight in the fairway on where we need to be. And so, you know, we're doing that. Now, all that said, you know, you're right, we're striving to be, you know, innovative. You know, we're trying to, to reinvent who at and is so that we embed, you know, data and AI at the fabric of what we do. And we're evangelizing this to all of our business leaders. And, and they're so receptive. Um, I mean, I think we're at really at a, a pivotal point in at and where, you know, we, we do great things with data and AI, but it's really going to become the, the foundation uh, of what we do, of how we operate the business. Um, you know, I'll tell you, we, we did an analysis recently with some external partners and we had them grade us where we are on the AI maturity scale. You know, I mean, we always, we could grade our own homework, but you know, we're always blinded by that pretty picture that we all like to paint. But we had our external partners kind of grade us and said, you know, no holds barred, give us a, a, a good assessment. And it was a really great story. I mean, it was something we were encouraged about. I mean, we've, you know, we were very, 
we're where we need to be on an AI maturity scale. We're 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 really great in terms of of our industry. Um, we're we're really great in terms of the whole landscape, honestly. And we've created a you've seen it an environment that's very nimble, that's state of the art, it's just really effective. Um, and leveraging Databricks is a core part of that. You know, it gives us the power and the flexibility, you know, to drive what we need to drive to achieve our vision. Yeah, I mean, I had the opportunity to be on campus, you know, I guess it was last month, a few weeks back. And I, you know, I really appreciated just you and your leadership team talking to your broader data teams and the engineering teams around the goals for, for the transformation and then showcasing some projects that were really changing things for your customers. And tell us a little bit about your approach to, you, you talked about evangelizing these things. You've talked about, you know, really trying to keep that balance between, you know, ensuring compliance and innovation can, can be met at the same time. How much is communicating to your team um, part of that equation for you and, and your leaders? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's foundational. Um, and when we talk about data and AI, obviously, so I run a, you know, chief data office organization. You know, we are data and AI experts. We're doing, you know, the right thing. I think we're, we're where we need to be. But at and I think, has the potential to be a data and AI powerhouse. And we can't do that if, if there's only one or two teams great in data and AI. So what we're doing is really evangelizing. Um, this across the board. I mean, our, our view is, and our goal is to democratize data and AI skills across all parts of the firm. And if we're all great, we will be that powerhouse. We will be that that, that great company. And so that's what we're doing. That's you know, the event you were part of was part of that, you know, democratization, right? It's this, this great tool set, you know, shouldn't just be available to data engineers and data scientists. Let's find a way to expose it to smart people throughout the business, to people that need it to do their job better. And so that AT&T, no matter what part of the business you're in, you know, is really leveraging the best tools uh, to do what we need to do. There's obviously, you know, the challenge for finding and hiring and retaining the proper talent. And, you know, it's there's obvious, obviously a, a huge shortage in that area. Can you talk a little bit about what your approach is to that? And, you know, in particular, given that, you know, it is such a well-established company, the opportunity for upskilling existing employees to help them along that path to, to really contribute to the, the data initiative? Yeah, no, it's another great question. I mean, you know, it's been fascinating over the last, let's call it three, four years. You don't have as many people moving. And on, on both sides of that slope, you've got people moving all the time, right? You've got talent, you know, changing, changing positions throughout, you know, throughout the country, throughout the industry. Um, but what I think we're really doing, and we've been playing, right, is we've been playing that zero-sum game, right? You know, we've got a, a fixed amount of, of, of good AI talent. It's not enough to fill the demand. Um, it's just been moving from place to place. So what we've got to do, I think we've got to grow, you know, the AI the AI and data talent. And the way we do that is we work with, you know, our academic institutions to, to get more people into that pipeline. And then to your point, we also unleash, you know, people within the business who have the capacity to do this with the right guardrails in place. And so two things specifically we're doing on that, on the academic front, you know, we're working with, we just started a program with SMU, which, you know, great university. And we're, we're working with SMU to help them recruit underrepresented students into an AI program. And we're working with their, um, their leadership, um, with the professors there at SMU, so that the SMU provides these students with the theoretical foundation that they need to be a great data scientist. And we, you know, have embedded our technology stack into the training um, so that the students, you know, learn tools like Databricks. They learn the current at and tech stack. Um, and then they go through a boot camp where they come to at and they work hands-on with our data scientists with those tools and they solve real world problems. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully by, by recruiting kind of a, a group that's been underrepresented, bringing them through this process, we're creating a pipeline that just opens up a, a new world for at and and probably others too, right? Because these people are going to be incredibly trained, you know, when they finish this program. So I think we need to do more of that. We need to find ways to, to get more talent into the pipeline. The other thing we need to do is unleash those people in the business. So we call it mobilizing the citizen data scientists, right? The, the people, and it's not our term, but it's an industry term, but the people in the business that are not data scientists, but they're subject matter experts. And if they had the right you know, tool set, 
um, and could create AI, effective AI, responsible AI, they could really bring their subject matter expertise um, and combine it with the AI and really just supercharge the company. And so we're doing that. We we talked to you guys about it. And really, again, Databricks is kind of woven into this. We've created a platform called uh, AI as a Service, and it's code based today. Um, but the idea is to turn it into a low code, no code environment so that those smart people, whether they're in finance or, you know, HR or anywhere throughout the business can use this process, you know, attached to the AI data, the AI world that at t has, uh, the real time feature store that we have build responsible, but really effective models without over-reliance on a data scientist. And so I think we're, we're pretty close on that front. And, you know, we've committed that I think we can change the number of people within at t creating AI in the next, let's say three to five years by 5X. And so that's a big number. Um, I think, yeah, so I think those are two things kind of non-traditionally that we're doing to kind of change that zero sum game that we all play. So one, I mean, I think it's fantastic, the outreach to the academic community and really creating that pipeline, right? And especially in underserved communities. The, the other aspect of this is you know, you're starting to shift from perhaps a centralized model of building out that data platform to really more of that federated approach of that low code, no code citizen data scientist. Does that then put, you know, sort of shift the responsibility for maybe creating reusable libraries? Some of the things that are harder to get done and get right, perhaps, that your teams are building those and then, you know, sort of enabling or arming the different citizen data scientists throughout the different lines of business to be able to leverage those libraries and start doing more with, you know, drag and drop approaches to, to AI. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think we've, they've got to, we've got to have the same framework, but more importantly, I think we have to work on the same data. And so from, you know, on the data side of the world, we, we, we've always talked about a single source of truth, you know, democratizing that data across the company on the AI part of the world, you know, it's, it's often been that lone wolf approach. You know, everybody's on their own, building their own models, their own ML solution, but things don't often come together. So with the feature store, um, you know, now we have, you know, we call it like our water cooler for data scientists. We have that spot where all data scientists come for the best features across at t And I think that's foundational to this vision. Um, but yeah, we've got to create that framework and the data that all data scientists across at t whether in my team or in other teams can use this to be effective. So let's let's chat a little bit about ethics in AI and you know what you and your team are, are contemplating there or, or implementing today. Can you talk a little bit about your guiding principles for how you approach ethics? Yeah, it's it's foundational to what we do. Um, the AI is a service platform that we've created. Um, we've got an ethical component built in. So it's a best in breed solution. We call it SIFT, the system for integration of fairness and transparency in AI. And what we have in the process is that every AI model goes through the SIFT process. That's the vision that we have. Not in practice today, but I think we'll have it in place in the next, um, let's say, 12 to 24 months. Um, every AI model goes through the SIFT process. It gets SIFTed, per se. And SIFT does two things. One, it evaluates the model for bias. And two, if bias is detect detected, um, then it goes through a bias mitigation process to still you know, try to hold as much prediction as possible by, but, but by removing the bias from the model. And through the process, we've engaged our legal and privacy team, so everything's documented, and then we have the model documented as well. So we believe, even as we doc democratize AI and that we, we build in the citizen data scientist, all of our AI, you know, should go through, you know, a fairness check, a bias check. Um, it's foundational that, that, you know, AI is responsible. So as you know, like, you know, Databricks has coined this lake house architecture concept. And, um, you know, without this being, uh, you know, an advertisement for Databricks, I mean, we definitely appreciate the partnership. But just in general, the notion of a lake house style architecture where you can load data in uh, and run more and more use cases, more and more workloads, despite what they may be, whether they're, you know, data engineering, data analytics through SQL, machine learning, model training, all of that. How do you see the, the lake house architecture helping at and Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important for us. I mean, it gives us flexibility. You know, it gives us the, you know, the ability to go from, from storage to analytics quickly. Um, 
you know, and it gives us, you know, the ability for, you know, many groups to work on the same, you know, data, um, you know, in disparate parts of the company, right? So it's, it's really been a, a core part of, of what we do. I mean, we use, you know, as you know, other technologies as well. You know, I think we have what we, what we feel like is today um, a best, you know, inbreed architecture. And our goal is to always be flexible, always be interoperable, and always be looking for the future. And I think the, the lake house, you know, concept does set us up in all those directions. Yeah. That's great. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we turn to some closing questions and, and get your thoughts for those uh, leaders out there that aspire to be the chief data officer of an iconic company one day? Uh, so, what what career advice would you give to people that are you know really looking for a career along sort of the path that you have? You know, if they're starting out in their career today, what what advice would you give them in terms of project selection, career navigation, that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know. I think we're talking to a lot of, you know, data and AI people that would tune into the podcast here. You know, the guidance I give to our team at at and and I've given to my teams in the past is that, you know, data and AI, you know, isn't a science competition, you know, in, it, it, you know, in industry, right? It's not just about doing cool things in technology. It's about driving value to the business and to our customers. So really understanding, you know, how the two connect, I think is super key for somebody that wants to get into a CDO type role, right? Because it's, it's understanding both worlds. You have to understand the business aspect. You have to understand the science aspect. And it's the marriage of the two that really creates the holy grail. And so that's, that's something I can't stress enough. I mean, you've got to have great scientists, but to really be, a, I think, to be an effective CDO, you have to, you know, combine the two. And the other thing I would say, and it's not technical in nature, but it's really more about partnership. I just think, you know, spirit of partnership is so important, you know, to, 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 to really succeed and to grow kind of a strong network. And I think that's something, if we all strive for partnership, doesn't matter if it's within our company or outside of our company, you know, it just creates, you know, that path for longevity, you know, for things to stay longer. And, um, you know, it's something I've always been in my career. And it's just, you know, advice I always to give, give to people is to really, you know, strive to be equal partners, you know, with everybody that you work with. Yeah, that's great. The um, the one thing that I've noticed in the role that I'm in and talking to, to leaders like yourself is it really feels like AI is changing the culture of a lot of organizations. With that in mind, like what do you see three years down the road in terms of what AI is going to do for organizations, you know, holistically? We're really invested in, you know, integrating AI into the fabric of what we do to relook at all of our operations, how we run our business and to reimagine it, you know, with data and AI in mind. So I think that's, you know, over the next three, five years, that's just going to grow even exponentially. You know, we've, you know, we've looked at the value that we create with AI today across at and um, I'm not going to tell you the number, but it's very impressive, but I think we're still just scratching the surface. And I think, you know, by, having more people across the business, closer to the business with the capability to solve problems with data and AI, it's going to really just, you know, just help us reach that, that, that potential that we have. But one of the things I think that's really going to change is kind of the automation front. So, you know, we think about AI, we think about automation, they go hand in hand, but, you know, automation for the most part, you know, has been, you know, almost sequential automation in the past, right? Really cognitive or intelligent automation. Um, you know, at least at AT&T, we haven't seen that grow as much as we, we, as we will. I think we're, I don't know how many people know this, we're Microsoft's largest automation client. So we, 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 we use automation to, the, to its fullest today. But um, I think the advent of really smart and cognitive automation is going to be a game changer so that we're not just making sequential automation decisions, but that we're making really smart automation decisions that, you know, the outcomes become much more complex. So I think that's going to be a real big game changer, you know, in our company. Awesome. Cool. Well, Andy, thanks for your time today. It's been great seeing you again, of course, virtually. Uh, see yourself, you know, we'll see each other in person, I'm sure, before too long. But thanks for being part of Champions of Data and AI. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Can't wait to get back together in person. <laughs>